Welcome to Asbury United Methodist Church. We are so glad you've chosen to join us for worship on this day. And what a celebration of worship we have planned today. A good opportunity for us to just think about living a holy life. And so that's where we want to start this day. And we just want to start out with a, a prayer. I'm Pastor Bill Hastings, and we are, like I said, we're glad that you've joined us today. Let us bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to be gathered here in this place, to be gathered in our homes, wherever we may be accessing this service, that you are present there because, God, you, you are greater than our physical limitations. And so, Lord, we just ask, wherever you are right now, that you will pour your Spirit upon us, that you will allow us to just reflect that back upon you. You have given us such love, such grace, such mercy. We ask that we would be able to respond to that now and return that grace and mercy to you in an act of worship. That is what this time needs to be, is an act of worship. And so, Lord, we ask that you would accept our gift to you today, our gift of worship, and we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome. Let us continue to worship the Lord as we lift our voices to him. You may raise your hands, you may raise your voices as we sing of our awesome and holy God. Joy.
We have a couple announcements that we want to uh, put before you today. And uh, as far as we invite, you know, anyone to uh, join us as far as with our parking lot service is still there at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings where we gather in worship and uh, it's a great way to worship. That'll be done rain or shine that we will still be in the parking lot. So I just want to remind you of that as far as... Uh, Upcoming event that's coming up on Tuesday, we have uh, Erie Gives Day, and I want to remind you that that's a great time to support those local organizations that are doing such good work in our community, and we ask that you would uh, support them. EUMA is a great one to give to at that point. They have some donors that are prepared to match gifts on that day, so make those gifts uh, even more valuable by giving on that day. So, if you need any more information, you can check with the church office or you can go to the Erie Gives uh, website as far as I'm working with that. Same day, actually, there's another organization that is trying to uh, really work together to uh, help out the community and uh, the school students in particular, and that is Mask Erie, and they are looking for about 9,000 masks to be made. And we are going to try and do our part here as well. We are going to have a mask-making day. As far as in our social hall, we will be socially distanced and things, but there, you don't have to be able to sew to participate in this. They're going to need some folks that will be cutting material. they will be uh, folks, you know, packaging some things up. There will be a lot of different things that can be done, but you do need to wear a mask and you will be socially distanced. But that's going to be here in the social hall. So if you want to be involved with that, Tuesday morning from 9 till noon that we will be working with that. So I want to mention those couple items in particular to keep in mind. Also remember that we're always collecting some food for the uh, Milk Creek Food Pantry and uh, the West Milk Creek Food Pantry to be specific. And uh, this month we're, or this week we're looking at spaghetti and sauce as well as uh, always doing cereal. So uh, those are some of the things that I wanted to mention as far as an announcements today. And now we will go to our scripture reading for today. First Peter chapter one, verses 14 to 16. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Come to the time for uh, the sharing of some joys and concerns with one another. And I do remind you once again that it is a great opportunity, you know, if you would email me those prayer requests or email them into the office or call the office. That way we can make sure that we're uh, making, putting those folks on our prayer list and things to work with. And I do remind you the prayer list is on the back of the bulletin. And if you need the bulletin to be uh, sent up to you, then we ask for that to be done as well and uh, we can make sure that you have that prayer list to be praying over. We had several folks who wanted to lift up this week. Uh, Mark Bradshaw is um, just needing some, some uplifting as far as for some things that he is dealing with and uh, working with this. Um, prayers for Debbie as far as Judy Rawls' daughter and uh, keeping her lifted up. Uh, Rita Sneary is really struggling as far as, and uh, we want to just keep her surrounded in prayer at this point, keep her family surrounded in prayer as well, and uh, just allow them to know that, um, that we are praying for them and praying for healing there. For Christina Williams, um, who is having an upcoming brain surgery coming along and want to keep her surrounded. For Jim Jervis, um, I, last week I said he was out in Texas as far as for disaster recovery, and it is a sort of disaster recovery, but he is dealing with COVID re recovery and COVID efforts to uh, work with a hospital out there and some treating some folks, and it's a hotbed spot where he is located, so keep them surrounded. The people in Lebanon, um, they, they certainly need our prayers right now as far as for the disaster that has been there and uh, the struggles that they're in the midst of. For Diane Wasser, as far as Margot's sister, um, she has uh, had some health things that have come up and she hit her head today and we need to keep her surrounded. 
And uh, if we can keep Irene Evans lifted up in prayer as far as Gordon's mother, as she's kind of taken a little bit of a turn here, and uh, I want to keep them lifted up as far as in our prayers. So those are some of the main ones that I wanted to lift up from the uh, prayer list. But we continue to uh, lift up all those folks that are dealing with COVID-19, those folks that are working with that as far as on the front lines. We think about those that are in nursing homes right now when we know that there's been kind of an outbreak in the Erie area with that. And uh, we, we just want to keep those folks surrounded, keep the employees that are working there surrounded. And we ask for a hedge of protection to be placed around them. But we just ask that... Um, nurses and doctors and technicians and those folks that are that are working in all of those areas be protected firemen policemen you know all those folks just need to be surrounded with god's care so let us go to the lord in prayer now at this point gracious god we know that you hear us when we pray and we are so thankful that you are there and you are present in our midst but Lord, we know that uh, we also fall short of your glory. And we ask for you to walk beside us and teach us and show us the proper way. Lord, we have lifted up some folks that are struggling today. The ones that we have lifted up today, most all of them, it's physical health. And we just ask that you would help their bodies to, to respond to the medications they're working with, respond to the treatments that they are working with. If they're in recovery right now, we ask that you would be with them. Be with the doctors and the nurses and give them wisdom to see what they are really doing in these bodies and what they are working with, that you would guide them and direct them as you have called them to that service. And Lord, we just pray for this community that you would find a way to help us to stay safe, that we would follow those restrictions that we have been placed under, that, that we can make sure that we are caring for one another and that we are trying to keep from the, the spread from this disease from going on before us. Lord, we pray for the businesses in the area that they would be able to remain open and remain safe in that process. And those folks working in the business that are interacting with uh, the community each and every day, that you would protect them as well. Just give your healing hand to those that are struggling in relationships, those are struggling with addictions, those that are in, in struggling with oppression. Lord, that you would come along and you would show us justice and peace and you would give us guidance on how we can make it through these days. Lord, we know that you are bigger than all of this. We ask that you would work with our elected officials. Keep them seeking you in their work. And Lord, that your will would be done. That's what we're seeking on this day as we continue to come before you and the prayer as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah. 
I think it's time for the tot spot. And you know, one of my favorite things in life is baseball. I love baseball. I, I used to play a lot of baseball, and I, I just have enjoyed it over the years. My kids played baseball, and we used to throw the ball to one another a lot. But you know, it's kind of interesting. I was coaching at one point. I was coaching kids about your age. And one of the kids came up to me the first day of practice. And he looked at me and he said, Coach, they're being mean to me. I'm thinking, should we be mean to one another in baseball? No, we shouldn't be mean to one another in baseball. So I was a little concerned and I asked him, I said, well, what are they doing to you? He said, they're throwing the ball at me. I said, well, well, you know what? I said, use your glove. <laughs> I said, actually, they're, they're trying to throw it where you can catch it, where you can just put the ball where it's supposed to be. And I got to thinking about that. You know, sometimes we have to use, use the tools that we have. And this glove is here for our protection. And I told him when they throw it at you, it just makes it easier to catch. So he kind of looked at his glove and I don't think he'd ever used it before. And he tried it, you know, to use it and realized that he could at least knock the ball away from him so it didn't hit him. So he thought that was an okay idea. But, you know, I, I think about that. Not everything uses a glove. There are other things in life that we need other things to help us. Sometimes people are going to be mean to you. And they're going to do mean things. If we have Christ in our heart, if we have Jesus with us, then we can get through some of that. And we realize that Jesus will help us at that point. So we can be kind to them back, even when they're mean to us. And it kind of protects us from them. So that's what I'm going to encourage you. Make sure you get to know Jesus. Spend some time reading in your Bible. Have your parents read some of the Bible to you and read some special stories about what Jesus would do. There were a lot of times where people were mean to Jesus. It was kind of hard on them. But you know what? It was kind of like he had a glove and he was protected because God was with him and it was okay so just remember sometimes you might think that it's not good but sometimes you're given more protection the Bible will give you a lot of protection it's a good resource to use when the world seems kind of mean so that's what I wanted to remind you of today so let's pray Lord I ask you to be with the kids that are out there today and let them realize that um, you would like to help protect them. You would like to be that tool that they can use to help them when they are in tough situations. And it seems hard that they can call on you and you will be there and you will help them through that moment. Lord, that's what you do over and over again. Even when we make mistakes and don't do it quite right, you are there to help us. And so, Lord, we need to get to know you. We need to get to know how to use you properly. Just as I learned how to use a baseball glove over the years, you have taught me how to use your word. And your word is a true gift. Let these kids recognize that word as that gift that they will be able to wear comfortably and use it for years and years to come. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, kids. We have our second scripture for today, and you can see that we've left the Old Testament, and now we are going to do a few weeks where we're looking at the, the book of James. And uh, it's, it's a great book to give us good instruction on how we should be living in Christ. And so I'm going to focus a little more on the uh, first chapter today as we're going to be talking. I'm going to read to you out of James chapter 1, I believe it's 19 through 21. So hear these words. 
My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Word of God for the people of God. As we are challenged this morning to um, pursue God and and to live a holy life, may we look to Jesus and may we trust in his word. Take time to be holy, speak oft with thy Lord.
My grandfather was a very interesting man. My grandfather, and let's be clear, I'm speaking about my grandfather. He was very clear about that. It was not grandpa. It was not poppy. It was not anything. It wasn't like me and just Bill. But it was grandfather as we approached him. He was a a dedicated Christian man and a great educator. He was my father's assistant principal when my father was in high school, the same high school I ended up attending. And then after he had been my father's principal for a while, then he actually became the school district superintendent for a number of years. My grandfather saw things pretty black and white. Things were the way they were. It was this or it was this. You worked hard. You prayed harder. There was love, but to be shown reservedly. He was very clear with that as well. You might say that uh, he, he was just an interesting guy from a different era. My grandfather taught me how to play checkers. Very young age, he taught all of his grandchildren how to play checkers. And I will tell you this, I never won a game of checkers against my grandfather. If I remember properly, none of my siblings did either. He didn't just let you win because you were a kid. But you could say that having him born in 1887, I want to make sure I got that date right, yes. He was from a different era. But I will say this about my grandfather. His dedication to living a life of faith, and it was, his faith was demonstrated through the way that he lived. And that's an aspect that I think we should still be trying to emulate today. It's an interesting thing. As we begin to look at the book of James this week, we start to see that um, it's a call to holy living. It's a call to trying to be the most that we can be because that's what God requires of us. That's what God calls us to do. Now, when I talk about holy living, I'm actually talking about having a true consistency in our lives that reflects our faith, no matter what our circumstances might be. And that's an important thing for us to think about. Yes, even in the midst of a pandemic, even in the midst of a country that seems to be more divided than it's ever been before, even in the midst of all the different troubles we may encounter, I am here to tell you that God has an expectation for us to strive toward holy living. And that's something that's very exciting for us to be working with in that. It's not meant to be an easy task, but it is meant to be what Christ is expected to be in our lives and who we are expected to be for Christ. First of all, I think that it's important for us to consider just who the author of this book of James is. And it's kind of an interesting thing. Most people feel that the author of the book of James was the brother of Jesus. And that's a good thing to know and good thing to be aware of. And as we think about that, we need to also remember that James 
it was pretty well known that he didn't really understand who Jesus was until after the resurrection. And it was at that point that he came to understand just who Jesus is. It shouldn't surprise us with that. You think about the people that we know best, the people that we spend the most time with, the people that we're closest to, and sometimes we don't see them as being especially talented and gifted in different ways because they're just our siblings or they're just our parents or they're just our cousins. And, and I think that that's the way that that was approached at that point. And it's kind of an interesting thing to see. Remember this as far as when, when James and his mother and his other siblings went to see Jesus at one time and he was in a crowded house where they couldn't get inside and word got to them that Jesus or that his mother and brothers were outside waiting to have a word with him. Remember what Jesus told them at that moment and the words that they would have heard at that moment. They would have heard their brother say, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And pointing to the disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, my sister, and my mother. That was not a real warm and fuzzy family moment, I am sure. that They didn't receive that quite as well as others may have. However, James does come to accept that Jesus truly is the Son of God. He is the Messiah, and he comes to understand that and see that so clearly. And James goes on, and he becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And, and he is there, and, and he is knowing exactly what's going on, and he becomes a true leader and follower of the will of Jesus. And he pursues that will. James isn't writing this letter as really a, a biography of Jesus. And it would be interesting to see that because we'd love to know more about Jesus' childhood and things and what he was like. But that's not James's purpose. James's purpose is to write this letter so it's an instruction manual on how we are to live into the will of Christ. And so that's an amazing thing. And James put all he had into that as he's leading this church in the midst of this struggle. And he lived that out even to the point of his own being martyred in 62 AD. James is an important book for us to look at for instructions on how we should be living into our future. James chapter 1 starts in an interesting spot. We would think that, you know, with, we, we want to hear good things at the beginning. We want to be lifted up and we want to hear, you know, where we're going and things. And James lets us know where we're truly going to be going because he starts out in a different place than we would expect. It doesn't talk about the good life and all the things that are going to be the rewards later on in some ways, but he cuts straight to the chase. And this is what he writes. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Wow, we go straight to trials and tribulations and perseverance and trying to work through. James is recognizing up front that when we are trying to live a holy life, that it puts us at odds with the world around us, and it puts us at odds within our own human will, and that there's going to be a struggle, and there's going to be a difficulty with that that we have to look at. And he wants us to have the the understanding that just because we have these trials and tribulations around us, it does not exempt us from holy living. That is what God desires for us. And James states it in verse 12, where he says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's an important promise that's being made, and, and it is one that says that we are to withstand, and we are 
to live a holy lifestyle even in the midst of those temptations. Now, as I indicated before, a holy life will be met in battle with our human will and with the world around us. Peter wanted to write to us as well, and Peter wanted to give us encouragement as he knew that that struggle was one that he had dealt with on many occasions, and it was one that he knew that we would need encouragement for if we were going to make it through that battle with temptation. And so this is what he tells us to keep us from being distracted from holy living when the world around us, and he wrote this, Children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. That's Peter encouraging us. Those who have claimed faith that remember that they have been made new in Christ. We are not subject to some of those same rules because we have strength in Christ. We have the Spirit that comes with us and gives us some encouragement for that. So therefore, as believers, we are given strength to avoid the evil desires and the temptations that once plagued our lives. Does this mean that temptations no longer exist? Absolutely not. Temptation is with us, it has been with us, it's always been with us, and I think it will continue to be with us. Temptations are hard, but with the Holy Spirit within us, when we ask Christ into our lives, that gift He gives us of the Spirit, that we have a position to be able to battle back against temptation and dig into that strength to help us through that. Not only did Peter write about this, but also James was writing about it as well. And he reminds believers of what is the source of temptation and what is God's position in dealing with temptation. In case we get a little confused, and this is what James tells us. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, then when it is full grown, gives birth to death. This is where we need to really kind of personalize Scripture. If we can't find where Scripture is alive in our lives, then we've kind of missed some of the point of it. And this is where we need to take that moment to really think about what that last Scripture really meant. What are our trigger items in our lives that pull us into temptation? What are the temptations that are trying to break us from considering holy living? And I want us to really think about that. I know for many, time is a big temptation. We want to use time for all kinds of different things in our lives. And there are so many different demands on us in our lives for time. People always ask me, you know, have you been busy? (laughs) I'm generally busy. Am I doing something that's worthwhile? That's the bigger question that I have to deal with. And that's the thing that we, we struggle with oftentimes. When I think about time, I have to tell you, sometimes I'd rather be out playing golf. I'd rather be watching baseball, if truth be known. You know, there are times where I'd like to go hiking. So the question is, do I take that time that I was supposed to be spending with Christ to do those other things? Sometimes I have to admit, when I go hiking, that's probably one of my best times with Christ. So it's not that those things in and of themselves are evil, but it's their role that they play in our lives. There are other things that demand our time or well or or may separate us from what we are trying to do. Do I choose good gourmet food over tithing? That's a tough one. I really like food, but I know that God blesses me when I tithe. And so it's an amazing thing, but it it is a battle for many of us, and it's a battle that we deal with. 
Do I ignore the disenfranchised so I can have a better vacation? Wow. These are tough questions, and these are my questions that I wrestle with. You have to be honest with yourself and go through an assessment of yourself to determine what are those triggers for you. And try and be brutally honest with yourself. Are there some good things and and some, some fine things that are not sinful in and of themselves that may take you to a place where you Put them in an improper role in your life that may be that temptation that breaks you from holy living. It's a hard thing. So remember about those temptations. James goes on in chapter 1 and he brings us to a call to action for holy living. James, holy living is not about being religious, and it's not just practicing spiritual disciplines, but it is taking our faith and placing it in action in the world around us. And it's an important part that we need to think about. James has specific directions for us and for our relationships with others as well. James writes, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says it says that's a tough word that is something we need to really look at we need to learn from scripture how we are to live out our faith how we are to take that word and apply it in our lives and see where the reality is and how we are living it's an important thing We need to be encouraged in our relationships to demonstrate that our faith will go before us and will be the basis on how we truly interact with others, and in particular, in the way that we speak to others. That's one of the areas that I know I struggle with and I know others struggle with as well as controlling that tongue of ours. James provides us a warning saying, Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Wow. It's a strong statement. James is not messing around here. Chapter (laughs) 1. It's going to be interesting to see what he has to offer us in the other chapters that follow. But... Those who do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. As I was preparing this message, I took some time to watch a uh, video on Right Now Media that Francis Chan is leading and he talks about some of these different aspects. And as he talks about this idea from Scripture in chapter 1, His way that he states it and what he reads James saying is that we need to be a doer of the word. I like that idea, being a doer of the word. It's not enough just to read it. It's not enough just to hear it. It's not enough to just come to an understanding of it. But James is calling us to go out and live that word into the world in which we live and apply it in the relationships that we have that's an interesting thing ultimately james ends chapter one telling us what type of religion god is looking for and this is what james writes religion that god our father accepts as pure and faultless as this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world it's a strong word that is what we are being called to do to live in community with others and in particular to take care of those that the world may have set to the side that's the religion that james is talking about 
the brother of Jesus, the one that came to know his will, that thought it was more important that we learn about his will rather than learning about his childhood and who he was. That's our call to holy living. It's a challenge for us. We need to reach out and care for those whom the world seems to have left behind. It won't always be easy. It won't always be what we want to do. But it is what God is calling us to do as a church and as individuals. All men and all men. May we respond to God's message this morning and um, state our beliefs that we believe in God the Father and in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, and because of that, we can strive to live a holy life. As we come to the conclusion of this service, we need to believe. We need to believe and we need to let that affect our lives and change our lives and the way that we live them. James gives us a call to holy living. Jesus gives us a will that calls us to that. Let's do that as we go out into this world this week and celebrate that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Amen.
Let's give God an amen or a hallelujah. And if you're in the parking lot, let's hear your horn. <laughs> Let us lift his name on high as we leave this place. <laughs>